Okay, so without further ado, uh, I will uh, introduce our um, review speaker, which is Eduardo Banyadas from MPIA, who has been involved in, I'd say, the majority of the efforts in finding high-Z quasars, uh, and will give us an overview of the, of the field as best as he can in only 25 minutes. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Sarah, for the nice introduction. And thank you again, and shall we, for organizing this super nice program for this Azarag meeting. Super excited to be here. So yeah, so I'm gonna try to give uh, an overview of this field in 25 minutes. As Sarah said, this is challenging. Uh, so yeah, so I think it's not possible. I tried, but then I decided that it's not possible to do this in 25 minutes. This is good. It's a very exciting field uh, with lots of development in the last few years. And I'm 100% sure that I missed some of your work. So if that's the case, and I think you should be added to these slides, send me an email. I'll try to, if, this, if I miss too many references, I'll try to upload an updated PDF of this talk with complete references. And this is also a very observational uh, overview. So if, if also if you have some theory papers that should be included here, let me know. All right, so these are the main topics for this SASRAC pro, uh, meeting, right? So detecting hierarchy quasars, supermassive black hole formation, the host of hierarchy quasars, and quasar proximity zones. So I think Xiaowei and Sarah did a really great job choosing the talks, and it was, I'm sure, very challenging to decide which topics to, to, to discuss during this meeting. Of course, there are many other topics that had to be left out because of time. Maybe there will be another meeting about this in, in the future. Uh, I had to choose what to talk about for this overview, so I'm going to talk about the, 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 the items here in black, See, detecting hierarchy quasars, supermassive black hole formation, the host galaxies. And even though it's not in the main topics, it's still related with the quasar proximity zones. I wanted to mention how we can use quasars to prove the intergalactic medium at the epoch of reionization, given that reionization is, is in the title of this conference. Okay, so let's put this into context. I'm sure, you all seen a picture like this the history of the universe. We have the CMB, Big Bang at the left. Then basically for a while, the universe was mostly neutral, neutral hydrogen, until at some point the first stars, the first galaxies, the first black holes start to form. They start to produce the high energy photons to reionize the universe. So this is when the universe start to become, go, from, go from being neutral to ionized. This is what we call the epoch of reionization. And this all happens within the first billion years of the universe. Uh, so this is more or less about redshift six or particularly the plan 5.5. So this is where this meeting is focusing on. And in particular, this, uh, we're also very, it's going to be very focused on quasars. So quasars are these supermassive black holes that are actively accreting matter that are growing and they live in massive galaxies. So this is what we are meeting for. So, all right. So then, uh, the first session of this Zazarak meeting is about detecting hierarchy quasars, which I prefer to call identifying hierarchy quasars, because detect, I, I think we, the quasars are detected, but the, the difficult part is to know if they are quasars or not. So just briefly, I want to, to just for background, how we find these quasars. So here in the, Right panel, I'm showing a typical quasar spectrum. So the, there I'm highlighting the Lyman alpha line, and then we also see the, the continuum and other emission lines. And on top of that, I'm plotting filters. So this is the I, the Z, and the Y band. And the, in the left panel, I'm showing a color color diagram. So Z minus Y and I minus Z. So basically, if you have the spectrum, you have photometry of this quasar in this bands, you can measure a color. And this point here, um, is, is what you measure. And then if you, if you put this quasar at higher and higher redshift, you can repeat the experiment. And basically, you, got, you know where an object like this should live in a, in a 
in a diagram like this. So in principle, this should be simple, right? So if you take images of, of, of the sky and select red objects, you should identify Harashi quasars. You know, in practice, this is not as easy as it sounds because there are also contaminants in the sky. So contaminants, things that look similar to Harashi quasars in color space, um, but they are much, much more numerous. And these are basically brown dwarfs or M, M and LT dwarfs. So I'm not gonna go into much detail. I think uh, there, there, there will be a few talks talking about quasar selection, but this is the basic. And of course there are new methods being developed using machine learning techniques and also SED feeding. And, and I think this is, this is just gives you the basis to, to, to have an idea how are we identifying these hierarchy quasars. So we have candidates, but then eventually you need to take a spectrum to, to confirm their, their nature. So this is difficult for several reasons. So bright quasars that achieve greater than six are very rare. So you expect less than one per cubic gigaparsec at redshift six. So if that doesn't mean anything to you, especially you expect less than one per hundred square degrees. So these are the bright quasars. If you go to fainter of quasars, then the number gets a little bit uh, more optimistic. Uh, but with HST, it's really far, hard to find these objects. And I think we'll have a talk about finding quasars with HST. So very interested to, to hear that. And, and to find these objects, basically, we need large area and multicolor surveys. And luckily, we, we are in an era of uh, that these surveys exist. For example, SDSS, PANSTARS, DES, HSC, WISE. So I think a big part of the community is using all of this service to find these very rare but precious quasars in the epoch of reionization. So let me just now give you an idea where we are and where we started. So the first quasar discovered in the first billion years of the universe was in the year 2000 by Xiaoyi Fan using SDSS. And you can see here, so what I'm showing, uh, can you see my mouse? Maybe not. Yeah. Uh, I don't think you can see my mouse, but so what I'm showing here is a, uh, is a, uh, in the Y axis is UV magnitude, right on the top and faint at the bottom and then redshift. And the bottom shows how many quasars we know per year. So this was the first quasar in the first million years of the universe, 10 years later, this looked like this, more surveys came online. People started to look for these objects. We were excited. This massive black hole existed in the one giga year after the Big Bang. So 2010, we knew about 60 of these objects. 2014, we were in the 70s. And in the last five years, there have been huge progress and a big part of maybe in this audience, like the most of the, the discoverers of this quiz are here. So this is how it, how this plot looks in the 2020. So this is updated as of today with the, all the published quasars. Uh, so you can see that basically in the last five years, the number has increased by a factor of five. We have lots of pain quasars as well coming from the HSC survey. So this is, now we have actually a sample that we can start to do population studies. And they are spread all over the sky. Uh, they are spread all over the sky. So these are ideal objects to, to, for multi wavelength follow up. So we can, now that we know where they are, and I forgot to say that this is still increasing. I'm sure that 2021 will bring more quasars, have some private communication that will be exciting discoveries. So this is not finished. Uh, but once we know where they are, we can point all our favorite telescopes to them and do, and do, characterization. And to study these objects is really key to do this in a multi-wave fashion. Right? So these are complex phenomena. And depending on what telescope you use, you'll see different things. Right? If you look at the X-rays, you're looking at the hot corona, jets. If you look at UV optical, then you're looking at the accretion disk. In the medium infrared, you're looking at hot dust. And if you go to far infrared, then the, the host galaxy start to dominate. And uh, if you go to radio, then you start to see synchrotron emission and radio jets. So this is just to give you an example that 
really, these objects are bright, and with almost any telescope you 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 choose, you can study them in detail. So this is the X-ray observation of the current redshift record at redshift seven point five. Uh, so I wanted to show this because I won't have time to to review the X-ray literature. But if you are interested in that, here I'm sitting citing some papers where you can look at the most recent uh, results. Now, if we now we take a spectrograph, a near infrared spectrograph, and point to the same object, it looks more like this. So this is more familiar. We saw already a quasar spectrum, typical power law coming from the accretion disk, and on top of that, we have these very broad uh, emission lines. So these objects, I want to recall that these are bright, right? So we are ob seeing objects within the first million years of the universe, and this spectrum just took three hours in a six meter telescope. And the nice thing of quasars is that they don't disappear, right? So they, they are there for a while, at least in our lifetime. And you can go back and look them and study them in even more detail. So this object has been observed by nine hours or 33 hours. You can see some of papers with very detailed observations of this particular object. And you can do the same with all the other 300s. So now that we have a sample of more than 300 objects, there have been a few papers doing population studies and trying to see if there's some evolution with redshift, the most distant quasars with the with, with lower redshift quasars. And most properties at, at the moment seem look very similar. So there's not much evolution in many, in many ways. So this is just one example. Here I'm, we're showing the ratio between iron and magnesium two in the broadline region. So basically this is metal enrich enrichment very close to the quasar. And, and as far as we can tell, this is consistent all the way between redshift two and redshift seven point five. So this enrichment has to be happen very, very quickly. There are other properties that seem to be evolving or at least different than lower redshift. So this is another example. This is magnesium two redshift at the bottom and then blue shift in kilometers per second between carbon four and magnesium two. As you can see uh, at the highest redshift end, there seems to be many more like the blue, strong blue shifts up to 5,000 kilometers per second seems to be more common. So this might be that outflows are more common at this early epoch. Other difference that we're seeing now is in X-rays. So if we look at this plot, again, redshift in the bottom and then X-ray slope in the, the, uh, on the Y-axis. It seems that the, 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 the slope is getting steeper at redshift greater than six. The authors of this paper claim that this is not due to new physics, but basically this is it's a consequence that the quasars at lower redshift six are have higher inton ratios than than the quasars at lower redshifts. So there are some differences, and there are many more. Uh, but let me just now go to the second topic of this of this conference: of supermassive black hole formation. And this plot is basically redshift versus black hole mass for non quasars. Uh, so the blue points, well, all the points here are actual measurements of non-quasars, and I'm highlighting that the two most distant ones known at the, at the moment. So uh, these are two quasars are reached 7.5, and these are the ones that set the most difficult challenges to, for, for black hole formation theories. And the line that, you, that I'm plotting in there is basically how this quasar will grow if they were accreting at the Eddington limit, in, limit the entire time. And as you can see, if you go back in time, if you are accreting at the Eddington rate the entire time, you need to start for a, from a very massive uh, black hole seed. And we also, I'm sure we'll have lots of talks at a different, there, is, there was even a poll I saw a, demo, a few moments ago that still unclear what are the black hole seeds. Uh, but I think there is, in the future, we'll, we, it is, it's very exciting. So I think we will find faint, faint high redshift AGN on galaxies, and especially with a new generation of telescopes. And this might give us the clues and see if we actually see this, these objects, a high redshift that according, the, that, that the distribution will depend on what is the, the actual black hole seed uh, that form these massive black holes that we see today. 
And identifying them is not only is not the only thing that is important, important, right? So we also want to measure the black hole masses. And these objects that are gonna have black hole masses of 10 to the seven, a ratio 10, nine, actually we'll probably need the ELTs to get the black hole masses of these objects. So this is, we're looking into the future here. And I'm gonna move to the next topic. Uh, so quasar host galaxies, there's also an entire session about this during this meeting. And this is basically the summary of the field of on, on optical or stellar light. Right, so so we know these quasars have we can measure the the black hole masses, so we know they are extremely massive, and we expect them to also live in very massive galaxies. And so far, we have not been able to see the stellar light of any of these redshift greater than six quasars, even with HST. So this is the idea. So you look, take HST or any telescope, and look at your favorite quasar. Try to model the PSF. So this is basically the point source of so the, the central mass, the central black hole is very compact. And you try to model this as good as you can. You subtract that, and then you hope to see the extended emission from the host galaxy. And that's what you see in the right panel, right hand panel. And until now, basically, we have no detections. Uh, I think Madeline Marshall, Marshall will give a talk about this tomorrow. And I'm hoping that James Webb will actually change and reveal the light of, of the galaxies of these supermassive black holes. But in the meantime, we have been doing some progress on characterizing the galaxies where, the, uh, where these objects live. And this is, at the moment, basically using uh, two millimeter telescopes. As you can see in the SCD here, if you go to the far infrared, then the host galaxy dust uh, start to dominate the emission. And we have telescopes like Noema and Alma that are very, very powerful to, to study exactly this regime. So I'm gonna go through this very quickly. Uh, uh, basically, Alma, since, since Alma, we have revolutionized our understanding of, of the host galaxies of the squasers. Before Alma, we knew something about maybe a handful of objects detected with PDVI or, or Noema. But now with ALMA, we have more than seven, more than 50 uh, detections of the host galaxies. And this is extremely efficient or what, extremely quick. In eight to 30 minutes, you have a beautiful detection of the C plus, the C plus line. You can have maps and even all the way to redshift 7.5. The second, Key point of ALMA is also giving us special resolution. So we all we are now not seeing just a point source. So this is a, another example of the sample five quasar, where we see we see a, a complex structure. It has a size. It has also so, so the You can also say the uh, the dynamics of this object is nothing like a quasi stellar source. Right, so we actually now we are looking at one of the first massive galaxies that form in the universe, and and it's not a point source. The third revolution is that now with Alma, you can see once you you know where they are and you know that there is some gas and dust, you can you can try to see other emission lines like O3 and two CO lines on the same object, and then you can actually do start to do physics of of some of us. Interstellar, interstellar medium physics of some of the first massive galaxies in the universe, which I think is really, really impressive. And there are only a handful of such studies until now, and we will have a talk about this by Antonio Pensabene tomorrow. So I think this is that we are doing physics just 700 million years after the Big Bang. I think it's just remarkable. And the last topic I wanted to touch, uh, uh, just to try to give you an overview, is how we can use quasars as proof of the IGM. So since the since their discovery of Redshift 6 quasars, we've been using that information to constrain the intergalactic medium of Redshift greater than 6, but even, even a lower Redshift, right? So this is basically the Lyman Alpha Forest. And this is just a cartoon trying to, to show this when you, when you have a quasar that's very, very far away, the light travels towards us, 
And on the way, encounters some galaxies, neutral gas, and all of that is imprinted in the quasar spectrum. And that's what we call the Lyman alpha forest, which is just in front of the Lyman alpha line. So this uh, provides great information, but at some point you start to lose this because the, the, this saturates when the universe is, is about, it's, it's a little bit neutral. So when you go all the way to Redshift 6, basically you don't have much flux bluer of Lyman alpha, this all disappear. So basically we can use that information to know, to know that reionization has to finish around Redshift 6. So this is, is important, but it's kind of frustrating that we cannot use this same powerful method to, to try to put constraints even at higher redshifts. But there is hope. So from a long time, there has been predicted that there's another signature that, that quasars will be very powerful to prove reionization even beyond redshift six. It's called the IGM damping wing. So this is a signature that is evident when you have a significant significantly neutral IEM, so more than 10%. And basically, what this, when you have a, a quasar that's surrounded by a very neutral IEM, it produces a particular signature in the quasar spectrum that it, it, the shape depends on the, on, the, on the neutral fraction of the intergalactic medium around the quasar. So we can use that, like if we can find a quasar, a very high redshift, see if we see this particular shape and, and, and then, estimate how neutral is the intergalactic medium around this particular source in this particular corner of the universe. And this has been used in the last few years quite a lot. Basically all the redshift seven, redshift greater than seven quasars that we know show this signature that was predicted more than 20 years ago, but only now we are, we have, we are observing this. And this plot is from, I took it from Yang 2020, that shows all the, the IGM constraints in the epoch of reionization from quasars. So there you can see that we know that redshift six has to finish. And then the one, the constraints beyond redshift seven are coming from this IGM dumping wing. There's a lot of scatter, but it's only based on four objects, right? So we really need to, and we really need to find more objects and try to map this. This also can give us an idea how patchy reionization process is. So I think this is really promising, and especially with the, the new generation of telescopes that we will find more obvious uh, above Redshift 7, we will have a beautiful map of the epoch of organization based on quasar damping wings. But this is not the only way we can use quasars beyond Redshift 6 to, to, to map the epoch of organization. There's an also another proof that's called the 21 centimeter forest that is similar in spirit to the Lyman Alpha forest, but this time you need a radio source and then you are looking 21 centimeters in absorption. This has also been predicted for a long time ago. And this is a simulation of a 20 million source at Redshift 10, where you can actually do this. This is 10 days of integration on 20 million source. This is really bright. So it's promising, but the problem is that you need a bright source in the background in radio, which is not clear if they exist. Until recently, there were no sources at Redshift, at Redshift 6 bright enough to do this experiment. But recently there are two quasars that are bright enough that you can actually do this. And these are a, a quasar average 5.84 and a, and a blazer average 6.1, which is very exciting. So these are, this should enable to do this kind of study. Problem is that these are still a bit too low redshift, right? So they were at the end of reionization. So, but I think I'm very optimistic that we will find more of this powerful radial aquasars even beyond and, and study reionization with a different proof. And I also was very excited when I saw this recent paper, there's another idea how to use quasars to, to map reionization, this using similar concept, but this time the magnesium two forest, so a bit complicated, but the authors here claim that with 10 very high signal to noise James Webb spectra, we can constrain the metal enrichment of the IGM and the neutral fraction at high accuracy. And I would be very excited to know if there are more ideas coming because I think quasars, even though they're thought to not be the main sources of reionization, I think they will play a role to understand how this, uh, this crucial phase of the universe happened. So I think the future is very exciting for quasar science. 
So if you're just starting with this, definitely not everything is done and there will be many things to be done in the future, right? So many of us were writing James Webb proposals a few days ago. So, and this is just to show you what James Webb will enable on, on a quasar, this is a quasar which is 9.5. So basically until now, all, all what we know about these quasars is up to 2.2 microns and redware of that is new terrain, like new terrain for discovery. So James Webb will give us all, all the, the optical lines. We might be able to see the host galaxy finally because the contrast is much better at, at further wavelengths. So I think there's uh, going to be a I hope James Webb will look at few quasars and, and it will be also really, it's also a very powerful tool to study the environment around these objects. So I show a, a plot like this at the beginning, right? So this is where we are in 2020. These are all the quasars in the of organization we know. And just want to finish with an extrapolation to what we expect. We know that quasars will provide important constraints on the epic organization, supermassive black hole formations, massive galaxy formation. And, and I think this is not the end, right? So there will be hopefully soon Euclid, Rubin Observatory and the Roman Space Telescope, and they will enable discovery of more of these wizards, higher redshift and painter. And this is what it should look like in, in, in a few years from now. Uh, so I think there's a lot of science coming up with from these quizzes in the back of organization, and I'm going to finish there. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Eduardo. Uh, if anyone, everyone can give a round of applause. Uh, all right, we have time. Uh, Sarah, you're muted. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Uh, Wan Cheng Chen asks, uh, can DLAs act as coronagraphs to help resolve quasar host galaxies in the UV at redshift 6? That's a good question. Uh, I think the answer is yes, and that has been done at lower redshift, but until the problem is that you need a, a DLA that very close to the quasar. Right, so basically, you need a, a approximate DLA. And until recently, we didn't know many of those. I think now we have a sample, and it's something that we should look into that. Because basically, every 100 quasars, you find one proximate DLA. And now that we have 300, we have a sample of three to five where we shall we shall take advantage of that as done at lower redshift. Um. Another question. Uh, can you say more about the stellar masses of these quasars? How are they derived? Uh, yeah, so as I said, that's also a, an excellent question. And I hope the James JWST will give us a better answer than I can do now. Right, so the stellar light has been impossible to, to see directly. So what we are doing now is basically inferring the, the dynamical masses from from C plus, from 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 C plus uh, observations, and then using a conversion uh, to to estimate star formation rates. But the direct stellar masses, I think, they are still unconstrained. And the uh, last question: uh, Why is there a gap in magnitude and redshift for the predicted quasars that will be discovered? Uh, between redshift seven and eight, and magnitude twenty-three to twenty-two. Uh, so this is the plot I'm showing right now, right? Can you repeat the question? Uh, why is there a gap uh, in the magnitude and redshift in this diagram? So between yes. redshift seven and eight, and minus twenty-two and minus twenty-three. Yeah, that's. This is by design, more or less. So, uh, I to create this plot, I use the our current knowledge of the luminosity function. And for Rubens, for LSST, I only estimated the quasars that we will find above Richie 6.5. So I didn't, 
I didn't do this for lower redshift, so, but Robin will, will observe also quiz at a lower redshift. The magnitude is, is depending on the, for all these different three surveys, it depends on the, on the depth of, of the surveys. And for the other two, for Euclid and Robin, I, I did also this experiment only from Redshift 7, but that's also what you expect because Euclid uh, is in the near infrared. So you, so it will, it will be used to find quizzes about Redshift 7. While Rubin or LSST, the reddest band is the Y band. So you only, only using only Rubin alone, the highest Redshift quiz that you can find with LSST will be 7.2. Thank you very much, Eduardo, for this very nice overview. Thank you again.